Good afternoon. I am Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I'm fortunate enough to be with Dr. Brian Lewis today, and our topic is thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, Brian is a professor in the, in the Department of Surgery, our Division of Vascular Surgery. He went to medical school at Southern Illinois University and did his surgical training here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. That was followed by a fellowship in vascular surgery, and he's now been on faculty in our Department of Surgery for uh, a number of years, I think beginning, Brian, in, in 2004. Correct. So welcome to our afternoon on innovations in programs in the Department of Surgery. And um, maybe you could start, before we talk about thoracic outlet syndrome, talk a few minutes about specialty training in vascular surgery, because I think many, in the, many of the listeners today will, uh, will understand general surgery, but not quite the subspecialty in vascular surgery, kind of what it entails and the training involved. Sure, the specialty of uh, vascular surgery has evolved over time. Initially, it was all um, completed by general surgeons at the completion of their training, but greater than 40 years ago, a vascular fellowship uh, was started. Um, there were variations on that initially, but over time, it's, it's pretty much standard that a vascular fellowship is a two-year training in vascular, intensively in vascular and endovascular surgery that is completed after a five-year general surgery residency is completed. Um, and vascular surgery covers basically all the blood vessels other than the heart. Is that pretty much accurate or? Correct. Other than the heart and uh, intracerebral or intracranial right. breast, or vessels. Yeah. Correct. So certainly the common areas that you work are uh, the abdominal aorta, the arms, the legs, and the carotid arteries in the neck. Correct? That would be correct. Yeah. And I think we have a, a recently completed videos um, on the carotid artery, I think by Dr. Rossi and, uh, and C.J. Lee talked about, uh, uh, about the abdominal aorta. So today it's thoracic outlet syndrome. And uh, we were just talking earlier that we both um, are Sylvester Stallone fans and watched Cliffhanger. And um, after hanging on the mountain, he must have developed a thoracic outlet syndrome if he didn't have one before. But maybe you can explain what it is to begin with and then we'll get to treatment. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a constellation of symptoms. Um, as there's impingement of the structures that pass through the thoracic outlet, and the most common place the impingement occurs is in the small, narrow space between the collarbone and the highest rib. Okay. Um, any of so the basically, right in here. Correct. And it's where the structures, artery, vein, nerve going to the arm, have to get back into the chest. Correct. It's either the nerves going out to the arm pass through that same space, yeah. the artery carrying blood out to the arm passes through that space, and the veins that drain blood back all pass through the same common channel. And uh, there's a couple areas there that uh, are implicated in thoracic mm -hmm. outlet syndrome in most individuals. So what types of thoracic outlet syndrome are there? How do you categorize them? There's three types. The um, first type is neurogenic thoracic outlet. That is far and away the most common type, create, or accounting for about 95% of all cases. The second most common case is a, a venous thoracic outlet that usually presents as a, a blood clot or upper extremity blood clot. That accounts for about 4% of cases. And then the uh, third and least common type is arterial thoracic outlet, counting for 1% or less of cases of thoracic outlet syndrome. So maybe with presentation, maybe we can go from, from back to front. So we'll start with, with the artery. So if you, have, if you have arterial impingement, so the blood isn't getting to the arm, but that's only with certain maneuvers, correct? Or not correct? No, I, most, at least a third of the population will uh, lose their pulse if you elevate their arm above the level of their shoulder. It's a, it takes a special set of circumstances for somebody to truly develop arterial thoracic outlet. Um, most people that have true arterial thoracic outlet also have a uh, bony abnormality. They've mm -hmm. actually had a collarbone fracture or a first rib fracture. They have an abnormal cervical rib, or they may have an abnormal fusion of their first rib to their second rib or some variation on that. Um, the most common times I've seen this are people that have actually developed a complete occlusion or blockage of the artery supplying their arm with or without um, degeneration of that into an aneurysm in the thoracic outlet. So they would know because their arm would be cold, right? Cold and, right. and they, numb. They, 
they have no blood flow to their arm, so their arm is pale, it may be painful, and they, they have no good blood flow going to that arm. And that would be a fair, that would be an emergency pretty much. In, in some cases it is. Some cases it's been more uh, slow in onset and they've learned to adapt to it. But um, um, they almost always have symptoms of um, arm fatigue with activity, arm fatigue with using their hands to do certain activities. And in rare cases, cases it is um, an acute problem where it happens all of a sudden and they have um, profound um, lack of blood flow to the arm and, and actually can't use their arm. Hmm. Wow. And so, so obstruction of the vein would then result in a swollen arm, correct? That is correct. People with um, a blood clot in the vein created by thoracic outlet typically present with a heavy, um, sometimes painful, sometimes tight arm. Um, swollen, they may have um, evidence of dilated veins on the anterior part of their chest or their shoulder. Hmm. And the so-called neurogenic thoracic outlet, um, so obviously that's compression of the nerve, but what, how does the patient know that they may have neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome? Neurogenic thoracic outlet is um, probably the hardest to diagnose. From an arterial and venous, it's pretty clear. They don't have good blood flow to the arm or they don't have good return of blood from the arm. But neurogenic is a lot harder to sort out. They have um, pain in the arm sometimes. They may have numbness and tingling in the arm. Sometimes it's weakness. It can be shoulder pain, neck pain. Um, there's a very a wide variety of symptoms that, that can present from neurogenic thoracic outlet. I think the trick to neurogenic thoracic outlet is the um, making of the diagnosis. And you probably have to, you usually have to rule out other things such as um, cervical spine disease, carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar tunnel syndrome, rotator cuff problems, rarely um, tumors or some other cause for it. So I imagine the patients are oftentimes a little bit frustrated because they've, they've undoubtedly seen a few doctors on their way to finally getting the diagnosis correct. I think that's correct, especially for neurogenic thoracic outlet, where um, it's, it's a hard diagnosis to make and, and they've um, had symptoms that are not attributable to a certain thing very easily. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they've, they've lived through quite a period of time with having um, symptoms in their upper extremity before, before the diagnosis is made. Now, at what age do, do most of these patients present? Is it more common in men than women or vice versa? And why does it, since it's a structural or anatomic problem, why is it not present since early age? Why, why does it all of a sudden become symptomatic? It does present at any age. So we see people uh, or patients in a spectrum. Um, I've seen patients as young as you know, 12 or 14 years of age, all the way up into middle age and older. So it presents over a wide variety. Um, men and women in my practice have been probably equally represented. Um, there probably is a slight in the literature, a slightly male preponderance for it, but I, my practice has been pretty even. Yeah, any relationship to weightlifters? Um, interestingly, there is um, neurogenic in particular, venous in particular, there is an association with repetitive activity. So it may be sporting activities or it may be um, work related, where if you have a um, chronic repetitive use of person on an assembly line or something else at work, or um, baseball players, um, volleyball players, weightlifting, gymnasts, anything that has a lot of repetitive activity, they are at higher risk for probably developing a thoracic outlet syndrome. So how do you treat it? Well, it depends what type. So for the most common variation, which is neurogenic, the first line therapy is actually medical therapy and physical therapy. A fair number of patients can get great symptom relief and not require an operation or any other intervention. And uh, physical therapy alone uh, seems to help a lot of people with neurogenic thoracic outlet. Only when they've failed uh, uh, an appropriate trial of um, conservative therapy would, he, would we talk to the patients about surgical intervention for thoracic outlet syndrome when it comes to neurogenic thoracic outlet. And what operation would you do? There's a, a couple different approaches for it. Um, one approach and the one I most commonly do is called a, a transaxillary approach for thoracic outlet decompression. And that's making a small incision in the armpit. And you uh, basically go down to the chest wall and follow the chest wall up to you find the first rib and you resect a segment of that first rib. And in doing so, you open up that space between the collarbone and the first rib. And it also gets rid of some of the small muscles in the neck that sometimes cause the impingement. There's a second approach, which is um, a supraclavicular. So you make an incision just above the level of the collarbone, and you can easily do the operation from that approach as well. 
Which do you prefer? I do the transaxillary most commonly. Yeah. And how long is the patient in the hospital usually? Most patients stay a single night in the hospital. Well, occasionally two, but most patients stay one night. Yeah. Obviously, if someone presents with uh, an acute obstruction of the artery, then you have to deal with the artery. Do you also take out the first rib at the same time? Correct. It's a little trickier. So when somebody shows up with an acute arterial occlusion, we need to first diagnose why they had the occlusion. Mm -hmm. If it's due to thoracic outlet and it's been acute, we may try to use um, or medications to break up the clot, or restore, restore flow. They may need a bypass for sur surgery to reestablish flow down the arm. And this would quite often be done in conjunction with uh, a decompression or surgery of the thoracic outlet. When they have arterial thoracic outlet, we would prefer in general to use a supraclavicular or the incision made above the collarbone because that allows us um, more direct access to the artery for repair. Sure. Clearly a, a much more serious situation than an, than an elective uh, d first rib resection for neurogenic thoracic outlet. That would outlet be correct. Syndrome. Yeah. Correct. And correct. then if someone presents with a big swollen arm and they have a clot in their subclavian vein, how, how is that dealt with now? Right, we see patients on both ends of the spectrum from a clot. Some people have um, been diagnosed with a clot and have sought care and uh, been treated medically with blood thinners. And, and then in a more elective fashion, we can take their first rib out. If somebody presents acutely to us with a clot and has a swollen arm, we would typically take the patient and, and um, use medications to try to break up the clot and relieve the obstruction in the arm. And then after an appropriate time period, we uh, uh, choose um, along with the patient in, in concert with them, when would be the appropriate time for them to have the first rib removed. So to break up the clot, would you, you, you would put a catheter then in? Would you use intravenous uh, thrombolysis is the, would be the medical term? Correct. Would that put a, um, we typically place an IV with a catheter in it through a vein in their arm and place this up into the area of clot and, uh, and instill medication, um, tissue plasminogen activator to uh, break up the clot and relieve the obstruction. Yeah, well, fascinating. Well, Brian, thank you so much. This was a beautifully comprehensive review of thoracic outlet syndrome. And I think there are, there are very few areas where, where listeners and the lay public can find information on this relatively rare disease, but probably a disease which is, uh, which is underdiagnosed. And we will have a couple slides remaining after this video providing more information on this topic. Thank you all so much uh, for listening.